Okay. Welcome to Second Sunday for February 2023. I'm Paul Lover, a volunteer with the Friends of Great Swamp. Our Second Sunday programs are made possible by the Friends of Great Swamp and by the generous support of the Marta Heflin Foundation. Today, we are both excited and honored to have Randy Little and his presentation in the Macaulay Library at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Randy grew up in the village of Forest Home, which is part of Ithaca, New York. As a boy, he developed a strong interest in birds and soon began visiting the nearby Cornell University campus. There, he met two giants of ornithology, Dr. Arthur A. Allen, Arthur A. Allen and Dr. Peter Paul Kellogg. Now, at that time, Doc Allen, as he was known, was busy studying birds' nests. As it turns out, Randy had a keen eye for finding them. It was a perfect fit, and Randy was put to work. Working alongside mentors like Doc Allen and Dr. Kellogg, Randy became an accomplished birder by the time he graduated high school. When it came time for college, Randy was ready to study ornithology at Cornell. It was Dr. Kellogg, however, who told Randy that there wasn't much more he could learn about birds. So taking Dr. Kellogg's advice, Randy majored in electrical engineering instead. By studying electronics, Randy was not only on the cutting edge of Cornell's recording technology, he even began designing his own bioacoustic recording equipment. Professionally, Randy went on to a 37-year career at Bell Telephone Labs and ATT. However, he never lost his passion for sharing his recording knowledge, teaching workshops at Cornell for over 30 years. At the Macaulay Library, Randy has personally contributed over 2,000 birdsong recordings, his first going back to 1959. Over seven decades, Randy's contributions to the Cornell Lab and the wider birding world are truly remarkable. In 2003, Randy published this book, see it here, I hope, uh, which chronicles the over 100-year history of the Cornell Lab. The book is called For the Birds, but as you read it, you'll soon discover that the work of the Cornell Lab is not just for the birds, but for millions of birders and conservationists all around the world. So please join me. Let's welcome author, friends volunteer, and birding pioneer, Randy Little. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm pleased to be here. I want to acknowledge the hard work that went into preparing this to not just Paul, but uh, Tom Gula, the president of the Friends, and Laurel Gould, who's working behind the scenes on the Zoom presentation here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of the Macaulay Library. Has anybody heard of the Macaulay Library? Uh, several people have. Uh, do you know where it is? Have you heard of Cornell University? <laughs> yeah, okay. And it's in the Laboratory of Ornithology at Cornell University. So I think for history, perhaps I should start where Cornell started. Uh, during the Civil War, 1862, there was an act of Congress called the Morrill Act that was passed, which encouraged the development of colleges, public universities in the states to teach agriculture and the mechanic arts, they called it then. And the, if you will, impetus for forming such universities was that a grant of land, of federal land in the West would be made that the university could perhaps have for income, okay, to support that. Rutgers was one of those first universities, Land Grant College. And in New York State, it was Cornell University that in 1865 was founded by Ezra Cornell. So going back to 1865 is going back a little further than the Macaulay Library, but it's in the Laboratory of Ornithology. And it took about 50 years to develop ornithology at Cornell. Uh, and we recognize name. Ed, somebody has to mute mute, mute their phone. Their uh, could everyone please yeah. mute their themselves at home. At any rate, uh, about fifty years later, at the turn of the century, there was a, a graduate student studying the ecology of freshwater marshes and focusing on the red-winged blackbird. Uh, that student was Arthur Augustus Allen. Art Allen, Doc Allen, as he was ultimately called. 
And after graduation, he was hired to teach ornithology in Cornell in the Department of Entomology. So in 1915, when he began his teaching career, there was no laboratory of ornithology. And in the Department of Entomology, that seemed kind of out of place. So Doc Allen, he was quite a character. Uh, he put a sign up over his entrance, Laboratory of Ornithology. So 1915 was perhaps the start of the Laboratory of Ornithology, but it was kind of a tongue in cheek start at that point. And over the years, the university was uh, expanded and reorganized and uh, there was a Department of Conservation developed uh, and ornithology was moved into that and into a new building called Furno Hall on the campus. And that's where I got my first introduction to birds, to Doc Allen, and to some of his students and, and uh, helpers. So I can only tell you about half of the history of the Laboratory of Ornithology from personal knowledge. But let's uh, get back to 1915-ish, uh, if you will. And I'll, if I can start the PowerPoint presentation, I want to introduce you to the cast of characters, I'll call them, that were the uh, people, which is really what the laboratory anthology was. Um, there were quite a few people involved in the uh, generation of, of this institution that finally spawned the Macaulay Library. But uh, among those people, are we are you ready to go here with the slides? I, I hope everybody is seeing my introductory slide there now. Is that okay? At any rate, uh, doesn't want to go to the right. Let's. It still doesn't want to go to the right. Now I got to figure out how to advance the slide. Okay. That's okay. Working. Yeah. <laughs> cast the characters I've called, and really cast is I want to describe the role that that these characters played in in the. Uh, the birth and the evolution of the Laboratory of Ornithology and ultimately the Macaulay Library of Sounds. Um, <clears throat> one of the key elements of, of the development of the, of the Library of Natural Sounds, as it was originally called, was an invention in the 20s by a Theodore Case, uh, who, whose father and he went on to found the Case Laboratories in Auburn, New York. Auburn is a little bit north of Ithaca. Ithaca at the time was a center for motion picture photography before Hollywood was uh, discovered and uh, had a more favorable year-round climate for filming The Perils of Pauline and things like that. But in those days, it was silent films and, and you know, subtitles were put on them and so on. But in 1920, Theodore Case invented a way to put a soundtrack on motion picture. Kind of like putting a little stripe down the side of the film, sort of like the groove on a record that came along a bit later. So with that ability to put sound on, we had talkies, they were called, I think, at that time. And uh, to make a splash in the late 20s, uh, Theodore Case decided that, you know, he would put on a newsreel that had a live bird singing. So he'd heard of Doc Allen at that point, and he invited Doc Allen to come up to Auburn, bring his birds, and they would uh, record, they would film a singing bird. Uh -huh. Well, let me back up a little bit and introduce some more of the players here. Doc Allen, I've mentioned, he's, uh, there's a picture on the left there of Doc uh, looking through his tripod mounted binoculars. That was actually looking at the nest of an ivory-billed woodpecker a few years later in Louisiana. But the main picture there shows one of the early ornithology classes. A lot of women were taking ornithology those days. In fact, the, the woman, Doc is, is seated in the front row, a little right of center with a thigh hanging down 
in, in front of him. And at his right is his wife, Elsa Allen. She, in her own right, was a biologist. She had a PhD in Eastern chipmunk. And then to her right, the other gentleman is Peter Paul Kellogg, who was one of Doc Allen's early graduate students. And I think by the time this picture was taken, had uh, just about completed his PhD. Okay, there's a picture of Dr. Kellogg. Uh, I always called him Dr. Kellogg. Uh, his friends and peers called him Paul, his middle name, Peter Paul Kellogg. Uh, just like Doc Allen's peers and friends called him Art, but to me, he was, and to all the students, he was always Doc. But this was a little bit later, this picture was taken, and we'll get to the equipment that's in there. But uh, Dr. Kellogg, yeah? Oh, I thought you were trying to move. <laughs> Dr. Kellogg was the, if you will, the engineer of the, of the outfit. And one of the students there, Peter Keene, you may know more from home box office, and uh, Peter went on to be, become quite a cinematographer in, in uh, Hollywood and in the, uh, the whole movie business. Uh, another outstanding thing about Peter Keene that I'll mention is he had three brothers, two brothers and a sister. <coughs> All four of them lived to be centenarians. Mm -hmm. And I was able to re interview Peter for my book uh, back in, in uh, Westport, Connecticut, where he lived at the time. And he was sharp right up you know, into his 100th year. And, uh, quite a guy. But as a student there, he was kind of roped into helping in the uh, sound recording end of things. And Peter's contribution, if you can call it that, to the development was something that we saw in the picture of Dr. Kellogg a little earlier that I'll talk about a little later, a parabolic reflector to concentrate sound. Peter had seen somebody up in the balcony at a performance of an opera in New York City that was using a reflector to better hear the sound. And that gave him the idea. And uh, when he came back to campus, uh, they set to work uh, making some parabolic reflectors to try out. And there's one being used there by another really formative character in this whole operation, Albert R. Brand. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Albert R. Brand. He was a stockbroker on Wall Street. And he had, I don't know whether it was six cents or what, but he was interested in birds. He'd go to the Museum of Natural History. And uh, in discussion there, uh, he was letting it known that he was tired of being a stockbroker. <coughs> uh, and he'd like to formerly study birds. And he was told that the place to study birds is under Doc Allen at Cornell. So in early 1929, he sold his seat on the stock exchange and enrolled at Cornell under Doc Allen. And here he is a few years later uh, at work aiming the parabolic reflector. Now I to told you also of of uh, Theodore Case, but a couple of other people that are were key in the early development on the engineering side of things. Drew McLean was a professor in the electrical engineering department at Cornell, and Art Stallman was a Ithaca uh, electronics dealer. They both were very helpful with Dr. Kellogg in getting equipment together, okay? So the equipment that we're talking about was the film, motion picture film equipment that Theodore Case and his research lab in Auburn had developed. Okay, they got this all together here and Doc Allen said, no, you're not gonna record a bird in your studio in Auburn. You're gonna come to Ithaca and we're gonna record a bird in the wild. Okay, and here's his crew in Ithaca, ready to uh, do the recording. Okay, now at the south end of Cayuga Lake, where Ithaca is located, there's, there was a nice park called Stewart Park, and part of that was the Renwick Preserve, uh, a nice forested area. 
And that's where I got my first birding experience with these guys is in May on Saturday mornings, the Duck Allen would always lead bird walks open to the public there. And uh, my mother was kind enough to get up at 5.30, drive me down for the six o'clock start of those. Mm -hmm. And I'd get a ride back up to campus with Dr. Kellogg afterwards. So that, that's how I really got started in, in birds. But at any rate, in May, this is before the crash, which was October, mm -hmm. um, the crew was assembled from Pox Case Movie Tone uh, and Doc Allen took them down to Stewart Park and they recorded, if I can get geared up here, they recorded a rose-breasted grosbeak in the wild in lively, live recording. Let me play it for you here. Now that was perhaps the first recording of a wild bird, okay? Uh, and it went on to one of the newsreels that they'd show, you know, before the feature film. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it got a lot of public interest, okay? They also recorded a song, Sparrow and a House Wren, that day. <laughs> but I want to tell you a little anecdote about recording. The, I think the, uh, uh, the, the story still reads true to this day. Uh, the film crew saw the rose-breasted grosbeak and went after the rose-breasted grosbeak to get close to it to record. They didn't have the parabolic reflector yet, okay? They had to get the microphone up. And of course, the road best of went the mm -hmm. other way. <laughs> and so they went the other way. And Doc Allen said, no, come back here. Come back. No, the bird's over there. So they, again, scared the bird and they ch chased it to its third spot. And Doc Allen said, come over here. And finally, they decided, well, he's not gonna let us alone. Let's uh, see what he's got up his sleeve. He said, set up your microphone on this little old fence post here, the edge of the brushy edge of the forest preserve there. And they thought they'd humor an old man, you know. And so they set up the microphone there. He said, now, back on, get away. Wait a bit. And of course, Doc knew that that rosebreast grosbeak was a territorial male and had certain favored perches from which it would advertise its domain. And it wasn't before long that the Rosebreast Grosbeak came to that fence post and they got their recording. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the truths of trying to record bird sounds is you have to uh, kind of wait stealthily for the bird to cooperate. You can't go chasing around and expect to get good results. But when this hit the newsreel, um, it was not long before that soundtrack had been copied on in the studio onto a 78 RPM, I'm sure at the time, record, okay, a disc. And people had Victrolas at home that they could, you know, you crank the mechanism and put the needle down and it would play a scratchy sound. And Doc Allen was was quite the raconteur and he had this to to, to say to that. Gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you this evening one of the greatest accomplishments of the age, an invention which embodies not only the virtues of mechanical beauty and perfection, but which in its very elements is celestial, uplifting, inspiring. A mere mechanical toy, you say. Hey, that's Doc Allen's sense of humor coming through there. Uh, he was introducing the phonograph, the Victrola, if you will. But more to the point, he was introducing that they had transcribed this recording onto a record and you could play it in your living room. Okay. And here's a picture of Dr. Kellogg and, and Albert Brand uh, at the recording equipment a, a few years later, again, after the parabolic reflector had 
entered the picture. You didn't do that. Somebody's not muted. Uh, at any rate, the uh, equipment for recording was not exactly portable. You needed a, a kind of a, a truck or two. And in the background there was, was an early, early uh, vehicle for transporting the recording gear. Okay. And there was another, another uh, dilemma at the time that got Doc Allen's interest. He was a photographer. And uh, he let Dr. Allen, Dr. Kellogg, be the sound person, okay, the recording. But, and that allowed Doc Allen to focus even more on the photography aspect of things. And National Geographic was one of his, I was going to say his favorite outlet, but I guess he was one of their favorite photographers. And they sought out Doc Allen to write, contribute article after article in National Geographic magazine. <laughs> and one of the sort of issues of the time was the rough grouse makes a courtship sound that's not song. It's a mechanical sound. It's it's a thump, 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 thump that it makes with its wings. And there was argument over how it makes that. Does it beat its wings on its chest, you know? Or on the usually used a log as a platform on which to drum. Was it beating the log? And so with photography and recording, Doc Allen was able to kind of uh, set up a situation here. That thing in the back is a blind, what we call a blind that a photographer could hide in. And this was uh, uh, Albert Brand's son, Charles, that was wiring a microphone up here on the drumming log where Doc Allen would take pictures and synchronize with the recording of the sound. And they were able to prove that uh, for the first time that it was just beating against the air that was making the sound. Now, the rough grouse turned out to be one of my favorite subjects. And uh, one of the first things I found for Doc Allen that, that he took delight in was a drumming log of a grouse. Okay. and. Uh, he embellished it in the back with a little bit of hemlock green there to make it pretty, okay? But uh, here was a picture of the rough grouse actually drumming. If I can get the sound here. This is a low frequency sound, so your speakers are probably not going to do a, a great job of rendering it. But uh, give, it, give it a chance. Boom. That's the rough grouse drumming, okay? And I had hand-me-down photographic equipment from Doc Allen that uh, let me take pictures of the rough grouse. And he, he gave me a old flash unit he had, screw-in bulbs, just like regular light bulbs with blue plastic around them to give them a right color rendition. Well, the problem was the duration of the flash was so long that the wings would not be frozen. So you saw a grouse that had no wings, just blurred out. <laughs> and I saved up my lawn mowing and, and paper root money for, and I finally bought a strobe flash. That, <laughs> next problem I discovered was I was up close. I didn't have a nice long telephoto lens, and I had a blind that was right close to the log. So I had to put the flash off to the side that wouldn't be in the picture. Well, I got a picture of half a bird, you know, it was lit up from one side. So I saved up some more and bought an extension flash. And finally, I was able to get a picture that sort of stopped the motion of the wings and, and showed you the whole bird. Well, enough of that one, let's see. Okay. <clears throat> Another early recording, uh, this, shows the uh, fact of life of recording in the, in the early days of you had to get the microphone close to the bird in order to get the sound of the bird without getting the sound of everything else 
around. You wanted the bird to be front and center, okay? And that we called remote miking, because you couldn't, bird wouldn't let you hold the mic, you know, speak into it now, you know? <laughs> so you meant putting the microphone where the bird was going to be. And there were certain environments where uh, it was particularly noisy and very difficult to get the bird without picking up the noise. In this case, the dipper, it's a bird of our Western states that doesn't ever go far from running water. And the, the noise of the stream was very hard to overcome. So you put a microphone out on a rock or something in the stream. And I did that in uh, Yellowstone to, to uh, record a dipper. And here's what we got. Most of these streamside birds have to be pretty loud to overcome the sound of the stream. The recording them is a challenge. Locally here you get the uh, say the Louisiana water thrush that likes the 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 portion of the uh, Raritan that runs through uh, Sherman Hoffman, for example. Mm -hmm. They're nice and loud, but also they're where the stream is, is going to be loud. So it's, it's very difficult to get a good recording of, of birds of that sort. And it's not just birds that need remote biking. Uh, amphibians call too. <laughs> and uh, here, here was a, a case where they were able to sneak up on a toad that was, was calling. But then Peter Keene came back from spring break, I guess it was at time, and uh, uh, he introduced the idea of the parabolic reflector, okay? And here on the left is uh, Albert Brand aiming the reflector again. On the right was the idea of a, a humongous reflector that uh, could be carried around on the, on the truck, but the birds didn't always come close to, to the truck. And so that idea was uh, replaced more by the one on the left where you can mount the tri the uh, reflector on a tripod and aim it, okay? And once you were spot on, you, you could really collect that bird as if you were, it's like a telephoto microphone, if you will. And as a result of, of, of that introduction of the parabola to the work, it was a, easy, a lot easier to start cataloging a lot of birds' recordings. And Albert Brand led the way uh, publishing himself a number of those early recordings. And uh, so by 1934, they had started a library of natural sounds. And that's what it was called uh, until years later, it was endowed by the Macaulays. And in 1935, uh, the American Museum of Natural History uh, and Cornell uh, teamed up to uh, have an expedition to catch record the sounds of the vanishing species of birds throughout the United States. And this was when on the left, you see the, the court of the, uh, a, if you will, a dry run of setting up the equipment, uh, or a platform to get up to bird level in, in some cases, uh, a truck with, with the equipment in it. And on the lower right was uh, the facts of life that it took time and patience to re set up some of these recordings. And if it wasn't right next to the roadway, camping out was, was the way to do it. And this was on the site in the Louis, in, down in Louisiana, the Singer, Singer Tract uh, woodland, woodlot, uh, where they'd found nesting ivory-billed woodpeckers. And I don't know how many of the ornithologists among you know the scientific name of the ivory-billed woodpecker, but the genus is Campephalus. And Doc Allen decided this this tent that they set up there, that was going to be Camp Ephelus. <laughs> <laughs> so here he is observing the ivory-billed woodpecker uh, at its nest. And you'd think a bird like that ought to have a, a really snazzy sound. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Right, like one of these, uh, I guess you might get them in a, in a, in a box of cereal. You might get a, 
a horn like that. <laughs> At any rate, they they recorded the ivory-billed woodpecker in the swamp in Louisiana by putting their, all that recording equipment, the film motion picture film equipment in a wagon and having mules drag it back through the swamp to set up at Camp Ephelus. <laughs> but then along came further technology that allowed the phonograph recording, the lathe they called it for cutting the groove in a, in a vinyl disc uh, to be made a little more portable and they could put that in a truck, okay? And recording on disc had the advantage that with a microscope, you could look at the groove and decide whether you had gotten a good recording or not. You didn't have to send it off to Kodak Park to be developed to get the, the uh, film you know, back uh, a week or two later and discover that, oh, you didn't get a good recording. So the disc recording kind of took over. And in Tampa, the zoo in Tampa, they had a bald eagle, a pair of eagles, that caught Doc Allen's attention that that was the way maybe they were going to get the recording of a bald eagle. So here they are down in in the Tampa Zoo. Uh, and of course, this was not using the parabolic reflector because it was a captive eagle. They had Doc Allen up there at the cage with a microphone and Dr. Kellogg down in the truck with the uh, disc recording equipment uh, ready to, to, to record the eagle. And of course, you had to get the disc equipment running like you did the film stuff too. So he's, he's got it started and here's Doc waiting for the recording. The eagle continues to rubber, head right upside down. We have given him a small piece of fish uh, satisfies hunger. He hasn't been fed since Wednesday, but uh, he doesn't seem to be willing to talk anyway. Oop, let me see if I can get back. Uh, at any rate, that was, you know, he started the recording year and nothing happened. And uh, that gets old after a while. Uh, so they tried again later. Introducing Mr. Ball Eagle of Tampa, Florida, who is about to speak into the microphone. Come on now, you son of a beehive. Top. So things didn't always work out, okay? <laughs> uh, then came tape recording. Okay, mm -hmm. tape recording had been, if you will, made commercial. Okay, after World War II, uh, the Germans were, were kind of the leaders in it. They were using wire to uh, record messages to send out to the tank squadrons. Uh, and we, magnetizing a wire was one thing, but uh, putting iron oxide coating on, on plastic or paper for, for a long uh, tape uh, was, was a lot easier to handle. So tape recording, became popular. Trouble is, it didn't like to go out away from where you could plug into the mains, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, some early tape recorders were were uh, operated, if you will, off of portable AC sources. It would take a car battery and step it up to, mm -hmm. chop it up and step it up to 120 volt AC. Uh, but that was not very very good. But Dr. Kellogg, being the engineer of the outfit, took advantage of a sabbatical opportunity at Amplifier Corporation of America in New York City to help them develop a portable tape recorder. And here he's operating that uh, initial portable tape recorder called the Magnemite. Uh, you notice his hand, his right hand is on the crank. Well, the transport mechanism that ran made the tape move was run by a Victrola type mechanism. You had to keep keep cranking it, okay? And that was an art to crank that without introducing sound and in, into the recording. But it meant that you needed hands on the recorder, and if the bird was moving, you needed hands on the reflector to follow it too. And that's where I got to help Dr. Kellogg in his early recordings, okay? 
And I found it was much more rewarding, if you will, to be learning to aim that reflector and track quietly a moving bird than to be Doc Allen's nest finder and what he called his go a waster. <laughs> and and that, that came from the fact that birds don't count. And if they see somebody going into this blind where he was set up to make these photographs, they were very, very, very leery until they saw somebody going away. And once they saw the go away sir, go away, they would return to their normal activity and Doc would get his picture if I would be his go away sir. <laughs> but here is uh, Doc with his son, uh, David, uh, down in Arizona, recording a gilded flicker using the parabolic microphone. And you could see David was uh, cranking the uh, magnemite there and Doc was aiming the reflector. See if we can... You won't know the difference between a gilded flicker and a common flicker. And... Okay. They love to nest in the saguaro cactuses. And uh, that, was, that was an early recording of, of gilded flicker. Okay, it was time to publish some of these additional recordings that they'd gathered over the years. And for the first time, the large 33 RPM discs were, were made available. And a couple of early productions that the Library of Natural Sounds was used for were these American bird song records. And that provided income to the lab to further support the operation. And Albert Brand's initial endowment and in, in buying the equipment and so on uh, was finally being turned into an ongoing source of income uh, from the recordings. And here's Dr. Kellogg uh, looking at some of the Library of Natural Sound archive, if you will, of those, those boxes of magnetic tape were cataloged and okay. Uh, that was, that was the Library of Natural Sounds in the early days. And at his right hand is the apparatus that was used to study the sounds, <clears throat> the audio spectrogram. Audio spectrograph was the machine. The audio spectrogram was the, the printout, if you will, of a sort of a musical score of the sound. <clears throat> and that opened a, up a lot of research, if you will, into bird sound study, further popularizing things. <clears throat> then along came Kudelski, an electronic design and manufacturing company in Switzerland that decided that there was no need to have a crank to run the tape. They, they could figure out the uh, electronics of, of and battery saving uh, if you will, design of electronics, that they could run the whole thing off of 12 D cells. Okay, this is a picture of the uh, Nagra recorder, 12 D cells would power it. The first, uh, uh, and, and five inch reels of tape would give you, at 15 inches a second of, of tape speed, would give you about seven and a half minutes worth of recording. And with a parabolic reflector, we could go around recording more and more birds. But now one person could have the recorder at his side and aim the microphone with a clothesline around the back of the neck, to, you know. And so I got pretty adept at that. And this was a picture of 19, I guess this was 1961. I was heading off on an expedition to record birds in the Rocky Mountains in the Western states, because we didn't have much in the collection at that time of, of, high, of alpine species. Okay, it was a chance to really get out and add to the recordings. But at that time, the lab had uh, encountered a, a major change. One of Doc Allen's students, if you will, uh, was a, an elderly gentleman, Lyman Stewart, lived in Rochester, New York, who wanted, 
he'd seen Doc Allen's prize-winning photography in National Geographic, and he wanted to do the same. And so Doc invited him down to Cornell to, you know, give him a kind of a crash course in bird photography. And Lyman Stewart went on to win the, I think it was Life Magazine contest of uh, bird photography. And years later, to, to show his appreciation, when Doc retired in 1953, uh, Lyman Stewart asked, you know, what, what, what can I do to, to help you? And Doc at first was taken by surprise, but, it, but he owned up finally to the fact that there was this tract of woods just northeast of the Cornell campus that needed to be saved reserved because that was where back in in 1915 he and uh, Louis Agassiz Fuertes had discovered the nest of a yellow-bellied sapsucker and Doc had always called that woodlot sapsucker woods and Lyman Stewart bought sapsucker woods donated it to Cornell and now they had a place and in 1956 the Laboratory of Ornithology became a membership organization because in 1954, Lyman Stewart had come back to, to Doc and said, okay, now what else do you need? And Doc about fell off his chair, but he described his dream of a observatory overlooking a pond at the north edge of Sapsucker Woods where he could observe and photograph birds and the public could come and observe birds and they could reach out and you know, make the connection between birds and people. And Lyman Stewart uh, endowed with the Arcadia Foundation to help the building of a laboratory of ornithology, a real laboratory. So for the first time, about 1956, they dedicated it. Uh, they had a facility called the Laboratory of Ornithology. And that's... The original lab is in the lower left of this picture, overlooking the pond, which had been formed by building a dike along the right side there to impound the water that was coming out of the swamp woods to your left that was Sapsucker Woods. So that was uh, the real beginning of a physical lab of ornithology. Uh, the closest that they had to a physical lab was initially Doc's office in the upper floors of McGraw Hall and the Arts Quad at Cornell, later moved to Ferno Hall at Cornell. And Ferno Hall was where the Library of Natural Sounds had all of its tapes and so on, and the phonograph discs from early years, and the film from before that until Cornell decided that that was a fire hazard because the acetate film would uh, not be a a good thing to have in their buildings. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Elmer Phillips, uh, Flip Phillips was a, a uh, professor at Cornell who uh, I think had the, the honor, if you will, of putting a cigar to the film finally that caused it to, <laughs> after everything had been transferred to disc, of course. Where were we? Okay. The Lab of Ornithology became a membership organization in uh, 1956, I think it was. And I had the honor of being the youngest charter member of the lab. Uh, President Malott, Dean Malott at Cornell, uh, bestowed that upon me there. At any rate, uh, the library collection was moved off campus after I graduated to uh, out to the new building. Uh, and Jim Gulledge succeeded. Dr. Kellogg, when Doc, Dr. Kellogg retired. And of course, they're both in the picture here, a picture of Dr. Kellogg on the right, and Jim Gulledge on the left. Uh, and the collection had grown considerably by that time. And a lot of that growth was due to uh, this fellow here, Ted Parker. He was a Pennsylvanian uh, who went to uh, Louisiana State University but got enthralled with Louisiana State had been doing some ornithological 
field work in South America. He got so enthralled with that that he stayed in South America and with an auger recorder and a shotgun microphone, which was a lot more maneuverable and uh, easier to move in the jungle than the parabolic reflector, uh, Ted started recording the bird sounds in South America. And at one point, Ted knew more birds by sound than any other living being, okay? Um, so Ted contributed all of his uh, recordings to the Library of Natural Sounds. And another person that got the recording bug was Linda McCauley. Uh, Greg Budney had been hired by Jim Gullage to be the, his assistant to curate the Library of Natural Sounds. And Greg had led a recording expedition in Africa to add to the collection. Linda had signed up for that and the bug bit her, okay? Fortunately, her husband, uh, Bill McCauley, was an executive with uh, Shell Oil and uh, was on the field front of exploring uh, potential petroleum areas, okay? And Linda was able to go along to lots of good places and record birds around the world. Add that to the Library of Natural Sounds collection. And speaking of workshops, I had to get one picture of myself in there. Uh, as, as Paul indicated in the introduction here, for 30 years I taught a workshop in natural sound recording for Cornell as, as a volunteer effort. And here was one of our crew uh, out in the Sierra Nevada uh, in more recent years. But on the left of this picture is my colleague, Greg Budney, who I mentioned as, as getting Linda McCauley bitten by the bug of recording. And in the center there, a crew of, of uh, folks that we called the, the agents, agents of happiness, they called themselves. <laughs> the North American uh, Kudelski marketing folks <laughs> that had the Nagra business in this continent. Okay, I guess, and, and the, the uh, picture, the, the third from the left here, was another one of the Macaulay Library folks, uh, Bill, Bill McQuay, who had been recording, had been recruited from uh, National Public Radio to uh, join the uh, technical crew there. Um, at any rate, we taught these workshops in the Sierra Nevada, and they were pretty popular. But when, when Bill was retiring from Shell, and Linda had been... Uh, a couple of years at that point, I guess, and recruited onto the board of directors of the Laboratory of Ornithology. And at that time may have become chairman of the board. They, were, they endowed the Library of Natural Sounds. And hence uh, a well-deserved renaming of the collection, the Macaulay Library. Okay, so we've kind of gone full circle now. Um, from beginning the first recordings in 1929 to Albert R. Brand, expanding that and, and making a collection in, in 1930 that he called the Library of Natural Sounds. Uh, and incidentally, in, in the turn of the century, the archive was expanded to be more than just sound recordings. Video and photographs were added. And if any of you are eBirders, you may have contributed some photographs or even recording, sound recordings to the Macaulay Library through eBird. Uh, and this digitization has, has allowed the collection to be expanded humongously, let me say. Uh, what's this, over, over 1.6 million sound recordings? So, so my 2,000 and some is, is a drop in the bucket now. <laughs> and, and quite a few video and a lot of photographs. But the amazing thing is over 10,000 species are represented. Now, to put that in perspective, the number of species of birds in the world is just over 10,000. Mm -hmm. So this is within maybe 45 or so species of having recordings of sounds and photographs of 
just about every species of bird extant in the world. And I want to kind of close this down with a recording in tribute to Ted Parker's work in South America. Uh, our musician Wren, I think, is one of the beautiful songsters. Ted recorded this. Kind of remarkable. And I can think you can appreciate Ted's popularization of using sound as a way to inventory habitat. To make a, a sound recording of things that you can't see. And from that, the uh, World Life, World Life, World Life, World Wildlife Fund, and so on, have gone on to popularize the assessment of habitat, critical habitat worldwide, uh, to figure out, you know, where should we put our effort on preserving some of the some of the last refuges of wildlife? Okay, mm -hmm. and using sound to do that rapid assessment was, was the outcome of that. So with that, I'd wrap it up. And uh, I think I can entertain some questions. We probably will cut the recording here at this point. <laughs>